Hey guys, so it is 7 Inch Kara's one year as a webcomic anniversary. Not one year as a comic, one year as a webcomic anniversary. You can check out the beautiful watercolor pages over at 7inchkara.com or 7inchkara.tumblr.com and I am working on an anniversary image to celebrate. I pulled my patrons, asked them what they wanted to see and the winning vote was Pancake the Cat covered by pancakes and Kara the Lilliputian freaking out about it. I went ahead and I printed this using the blue line technique which you guys can read about at natosoup.blogspot.com in my watercolor basic series. I utilized the blue line technique to transfer my image onto some Kilimanjaro cold press cotton rag watercolor paper. Lines are a little darker than I'd like. I am going to pencil this and hope the water will work its magic. Uh, it is February 1st. I still have 10 days until the actual factual anniversary. So uh, if this doesn't work, it's going to be a shame. It's going to be a waste of my time. However, I can always reprint and redo. So that's why we leave ourselves with time buffers, y'all. So I am going to go ahead and begin penciling this. And I am using my very clumsy hands, obviously. I am using a harder light. I believe this is 2H in a mechanical pencil. That's just what I happen to prefer. Uh, my printer left some smudge over here in the corner. It is probably time to replace this printer because it does this a lot despite cleaning. And I'm just going to go ahead and get started. If you are looking for a step-by-step -step penciling tutorial, this is not your video. But fear not. Penciling is very, very easy. You literally just tighten up your line work utilizing a pencil. Okay, so we've got our pencils down. I'm gonna brush away the excess uh, pencil shavings. I mean, eraser bits, um, eraser smudge. You guys know what I'm talking about. I did that and then it kind of like smudged even more. Uh, going to do that and then I'm gonna stretch it and I'm gonna stretch it off camera because I just don't have room at my desk. 
If you guys are looking for a good stretching tutorial though, you can click here to see a demonstration of that. And hopefully a lot of these blue lines will fade away. It's like the moment of truth. And I'm sorry to shake the camera like that. So I will see you guys after I've stretched this. Hey art nerds, so we are ready to apply our wash to this. It has been stretched. Some of the blue has kind of dissipated. Not as much as I had hoped, but also not enough for me to redo it. And I went back and checked the settings I had on my printer and they were the correct settings. So I guess Kilimanjaro just takes that non-photo blue to heart. I'm going to go ahead and apply a wash. I'm also going to stick a couple of cheap erasers behind this so I can get a nice slanted surface. I'm going to grab a warm, sunnyish yellow. Hopefully that will combat some of that blue in there. And we're just going to do an all over tone. And this is 300 pound watercolor paper. I think I said that earlier, but just a reminder. So it's nice, heavy watercolor paper. I did opt to stretch it though, like I said, to remove the blue lines. Also just add a little extra support. All right, so start from the top mop our way on down. Going to use a thirsty brush. Just kind of soak up some of the excess. And then let that dry. This is mostly dry. The yellow didn't quite counteract the blue as much as I kind of hoped it would. And the paper is a little bit warped. As it fully dries, it's gonna hopefully smooth out. Um, I'm kind of debating whether or not I want to do another coat of yellow or whether or not I wanna go ahead and sort of divide it off by the horizon line, which would be if I were just doing cheaty cheaty, it would just be like basically straight across the table like that and paint top half one thing and the bottom half another. I think I'm just gonna go ahead and do that. And what I'm gonna do to help facilitate that is I'm actually gonna utilize a ruler like an actual factual adult type person. And uh, I thought I had a pencil handy. and lined up just using Kara's eyes as sort of our indication for the horizon line and since I don't have it anything over here to mark it on I'm actually going to mark it on the blue tape of course I nicked the blue tape which is not normally a good thing to do all right so next thing I need to do is I need to go grab a daisy palette and start mixing up some color. For, whoa, sorry about that, for the background, I think I am going to go with my go-to favorite blue, which would be Soho Urban Blue Violet because it's a really nice warm blue and it works really, I just like using it for everything. It is the best blue in my opinion. And we toned it with yellow um, to sort of give it like this nice kind of friendly, approachable, uh, sunny kind of feeling. So we're going to start out. Maybe I ought to do the plates as Fiesta Wear in like turquoise or some other really pretty bright color. But we're going to start by applying a wash of said urban blue violet to the background. This is a color I love using for skies. Not that this is a sky necessarily, but. And then I have some areas I need to clean up a little bit. So 
just do it as I go. Then I'm going to clean my brush, tamp it out on my paper towel, and just kind of soak up some of the excess. Unfortunately, it's darker on one side than it is on the other. Um, I guess that's not really like too noticeable a progression, to be honest. Uh, but I'm going to let it dry, and then I'm going to decide whether or not I want to do another layer up here to kind of darken that. And I also need to decide what color I want to do the tabletop. So I've decided that for the tablecloth, I w or rather the table, I want to do a white tablecloth. So the first thing I'm going to do is I mixed up a, a blue that utilizes a little bit of that urban blue violet, but it also uses some Payne's gray and a little bit of purple. I'm going to paint that all over and that's going to be my base white. And then I'm going to go back in after it's had a chance to dry and start painting in uh, sort of the cast shadows. And I just realized I hadn't, I missed that area up there. So I'm going to have to go back with the urban blue violet. And I'm painting this illustration to celebrate the one year anniversary. So seven inch Kara first came out in 2014. I've been working on it since 2012, but it first came out as a print volume for volume one in 2014, and it debuted at Mocha Fest 2014. In fact, I need to mix this background blue darker. Uh, and it sold fairly steadily. I mostly sell it at conventions. Sometimes I do get some online sales for it. And in 2016, I was approached by another comic artist about forming a comic collective with her. And um, we, we and some other artists talked about it for a few months. I asked some of my other artist friends if they'd be interested in joining. Uh, they were interested. So, um, you know, we kind of talked about it. And then kind of last minute, January 2017, this friend said she wants to launch in February for Valentine's Day. And I didn't have Kara online as a comic at that point. I had it just as that print volume. But in order to participate in this collective that I was helping to form, I had to have my comic online as a web comic. So we barely had two weeks, but with the help from Joseph and another friend, Sam, I was able to get um, the comic up on the main site, which is 7inchcara.com, and then up on a mirror tumbler that would theoretically make it easier to follow, although I've found out since that uh, Tumblr does not, when it comes to web comics, Tom Tumblr will keep posts off of people's dashes, like if, even if they've, they're following you, which is a really frustrating thing to find out about. Um, but anyway, with their help, I was able to get 7-inch Kara up on a couple of sites before that collective's launch and that happened to it happened to launch on February 10th 2017 uh, not unfortunately not so much fanfare because I'm um, sorry the other collective was supposed to go live on the 14th and that kind of didn't happen um, some things happened and that kind of fell apart and we ended up regrouping as Ink Drop Cafe and relaunching in April. So Kara never really had the launch fanfare that I'd really hoped it would have. I mean, I did the best that I knew how to do. Uh, I recorded a announcement video, which <laughs> unfortunately my computer just couldn't render it as it was. Hopefully it can render this one. And so that video is available as a time lapse, but it never, was available in its full tutorial form, unfortunately. Um, and I did um, a launch announcement over on the blog and on my tumblers and all my other socials and stuff. So hopefully this anniversary will go a little bit better. 
a little bit smoother than the launch last year. That's a nice, I think that's a nice saturation for blue. And I left it uncolored in here because this is glass. And the way I usually handle glass is I'll do a base color and then le just leave it. I don't uh, develop it as much as I do the other colors around it. And the rationale for that is that the glass is kind of occluding the color. And I think it helps give the effect of glass. So in tangential related news, Ink Drop Cafe is gonna be celebrating its one year anniversary in April. So got two exciting one year anniversaries. The first year is always the hardest, I think. And then you kind of hit a, sh a stride and you kind of got some things figured out. But that is exciting because as a co-founder, I've worked really hard to help not only promote Ink Drop, but help get it off the ground, help get it rolling. And I'm really excited to see it grow and uh, maybe someday be able to help further member, further artists, further members. And um, having Kara as a webcomic has presented a lot of really um, new challenges for me. I've been doing comics since I was 13. I've been doing print comics since I was 25. So I've been, I have some experience, some comic experience, but web comics is kind of its own beast and has presented its own challenges that uh, you really just can't, you can't uh, account for, you can't keep in mind until you, you've tried it and you encounter them. Even talking to other webcomic artists, uh, trying to hedge my bets. I mean, I've been in the webcomic community as a supporter and as a reader for decades. Um, even that was just not enough to really prepare me for my own launch. So it's been a learning experience. It's been a growing experience and it's been a challenge. So <laughs> haven't always met that challenge as well as I would have liked, but I'm also juggling a lot of other things. So I'm doing the best I can. All right, I am mixing up a darker version of that shadow color. And I'm gonna apply, we have some uneven drying, which is unusual for a cotton rag paper, but I wanna do some wet into wet blending out. And over here and under here and here. So it's been certainly a very interesting year for me. And hopefully I can make 2018 even better. I'd like to finally start taking advantage of um, some of the resources that are available to webcomic artists in terms of advertising, like Project Wonderful. I've, I have offered Project Wonderful ad slots on my blog for the past year to sort of build up credits so that I can start offering um, or start taking out Kara ads. And I've commissioned some of my friends to write some really helpful, insightful posts on advertising for web comics, so I can follow those as a guide. Okay, I'm gonna let this dry. But I really want to make 2018 the year where I um, consecutively can work on 7-inch Kara as a print comic and hopefully launch a Kickstarter in August. That's, that's the goal for me. Get volume two finally finished and then get it kickstarted and get it out there. It's definitely been a long work in progress. And just hopefully grow and find more opportunities as a children's illustrator and as a comic artist. All right, so I'm going to give this a chance to dry. So this has had plenty of time to dry. I'm gonna reactivate some of that shadow color I mixed up yesterday. And hopefully 
delicately get it on here. And we'll see how that looks after it's had a chance to dry. I'm going to go ahead and grab some Payne's Gray, get that mixed up. Because I have a couple of silver elements I want to get painted. I want to make sure I leave room for the reflection on the syrup dispenser. And do the same across the top. And then go ahead, a little wet into wet, sort of blend this one out a little bit maybe, maybe get a little more interesting effect with some additional water. I'm grabbing a lot of Payne's Gray, hopefully. Actually, I can increase my chances of it going successfully by removing those since they have a tendency to get in my way. All right, I think I'm going to leave that and then use some clean water, kind of soften that reflection a little bit. We'll see how that goes. So the next thing I want to do is I want to get these two plates and I want to use some really bright, uh, bright, vibrant, I guess, bright colors. So I'm thinking kind of like Fiesta Wear colors, like turquoise or maybe like a really nice red. So our first layers on the metal have dried. I am pulling out a couple of other palettes because they have colors I really like. So I can do the plates. And I am starting with the Magello palette. Because there is a super nice blue in here. And rather than being a smarty and mixing it in my daisy palette, since I have such limited room, I'm just going to mix it on my craft sheet. And we'll do this one in blue. And maybe that'll contrast really nicely with the butter yellow. I swear to hate how I handle elliptical shapes. It's always been kind of a problem for me. I'm gonna try to fake it. There we go, it's a little bit better. And hopefully I can get it dark enough down there that people won't be able to tell that I had to do that. I'm gonna switch over to my Holbein palette because there's a orange that's really nice. And I'll try to get this filled in without disturbing that blue we just put down. It's always a really nice treat to be able to paint Kara things on nicer papers. That's a little offset though because you guys can't see me but I'm hunched over uh, clipped in is not not a really good painting situation like this so when I paint pages I try to paint uh, create a environment that is comfortable for me to work since that's kind of like long haul painting but unfortunately the necessities of recording something 
even something just that's only slightly larger than the tiny things I often record really messes up my painting groove. It's hard on the shoulders and hard on the control. So I got to clean all that up because I just wasn't, couldn't get enough control to pull a nice line. Unfortunately, that doesn't want to lift. So I'm going to have to come in with a scrubber brush a little bit later once things have had a chance to dry and lift it like that. All right, so it's still obviously wet up there, but I have a white scrubber brush here with me. Actually, I was a dumbass or a dum dum and didn't clean it out properly last time I used it. So, that ought to help. And a scrubber brush is just a stiffer bristle brush. This is a synthetic. I picked this one up from probably Jerry's Artorama. And it's just used to kind of lift the, pig, the paint off the paper, the pigment off the paper. And then you can kind of dab it up. Fortunately, I think that might just be there forever. I think it may have stained the paper. So that's okay. We will let this dry and we'll just continue working. So I've got at least some of the base colors down, making some progress here, albeit slow progress. So I'm gonna start mixing up Kara Skin Tone, the girl whose birthday we're all here to celebrate, and now that I've got a basic skin tone mixed up, I can start applying it. It was really important to me that the one year anniversary image be in watercolor, since the comic itself is watercolor. And I do like to try, uh, or rather, I do like my promotional art to sort of reflect the actual media used in the comic. So sometimes that presents some difficulties. Uh, sometimes I have to like custom paint things for like banners and such. It's not as easy to just like whip things up. Spur of the moment takes a little longer to do if I'm going to do it in the same style as the comic. Or I have to be picky choosy about the uh, the promotional material that I can use to make banners and stuff. Uh, so like those long narrow banners that are useful on like uh, TWC or um, like the archive binge banner. Well that one was kind of easier as a slightly different format but those really long small thin banners that go horizontal are just horrible for me to design for. They're a huge pain in the butt. Okay, this color is a little darker than I'd anticipated. It's okay. We'll work with it. We're, I'm having a hard time getting consistent color mixing and consistent color lay down, but it's really slightly noticeable, right guys? Hopefully we can get this fixed in subsequent layers. I've been trying to do more horizontal format illustrations, like this one here. Not always easy, it is not my favorite to design for. This one kind of came naturally though. I did this in the, um, the ratio that my Surface Pro screen is so that it can be used as at least a, a background for me. To celebrate my own comic's birthday, Mm, it's kind of darker than I wanted it to be. Let's see if I can reactivate some of that color and lift some of it. Let it soak for a moment. Apply. So it looks like it picks some up, although on knife, it's not really noticeable. And 
and give Kara a chance to dry. While I'm here, I'm going to throw some shadow on Kara's eyes and her teeth. Good to get that in kind of early. And I'm going to grab some more of that Holbein orange and get another layer on the plate, hopefully tighten things up a little bit. And also get a more intense color because this orange, this first layer is just not as pretty as I wanted it to be. So this is kind of a blunt synthetic brush and I don't really care for it, but when you're dealing with a blush, blunt synthetic or just a blunt natural hairbrush, sometimes it's better. Um, it definitely will negatively affect your painting, but if you have to use one for whatever reason, it's what you've got, it's what you can afford. Um, I have found that rather than trying to let the brush do the work, uh, which you could do with a nicer brush or a brush that hasn't been blunted or whatever, is uh, just sort of think about it as guiding the bead of paint around on the page. And I'm going to switch my brush out in a moment because painting with a, a blunt brush really causes a lot more problems than it solves by being economical. So it's very difficult to get into these kind of tight corners here. It takes a lot longer. You're more prone to making mistakes. It's just a pain. And I do have, I do have a tutorial here on the channel about how to fix a bent brush, but something that's like this, where it's just ever so slightly blunted. That tutorial doesn't quite do the trick. It might be time to toss this. I've had this Neptune for like six years now. It may have just overstayed its welcome. Then I'm going to go ahead and work up here a little bit using some Payne's Gray. And we want to think about developing contrast. So this is moving away from the light source. Kind of a shame that the knife got so much on it. Hopefully I can kind of salvage that later on. and work around the sides with our stupid blunt brush and then I'm going to use some clean water. I'm going to kind of blend some of this, just soften that transition so it doesn't look so like obviously hand painted. And then go up here do a little bit of dark, not too much, because we do want to maintain contrast. Use the brush up here and do the same softening technique. And then go in here and got to think about this kind of critically because we're trying, not only are we trying to do a metallic surface, but we're trying to make sure there is good contrast. All right, then go up here, blend that out a little bit. Looking good, looking good. And then I'm going to switch over to the Magello palette and do some more of that blue. It's a really beautiful color, I think. I 
handled. I can step away from it for a little bit, give it a chance to dry. So I'm gonna go do just that. Went ahead and got a clean cup of water. Now I'm going to refill some of my wells. Hopefully get to make some significant progress. So I decided I want Kara's dress to be a really light, warm yellow, sort of the same color we did as our initial wash. And then I want to paint like maybe rosebuds or something on it, just something really cute since this is her birthday, basically. Her comic birthday, so I want to do something cute. So I'm going to go ahead and just do kind of a fill. And I grabbed some smaller brushes. I'm using a very floppy squirrel here. This is decent for fills, but you really need a lot of control, I think, to use a squirrel because they're so floppy. And it may not be worth the stress. Also, going to fill in the butter since we basically got the right color mixed. Got to be careful with that blue because sometimes colors like that will leach into lighter colors. And then we've got a nice butter pat up here. And while that butter yellow dries, I'm going to go ahead and start working on the base color for Pancake. Now he's a black cat, so I want to start. I'm going to use the shadow color as a basis and mix in lots of black, some Payne's gray and some neutral tint. And I apologize that you guys can't see that. It's one of my goals to develop a better camera setup for watercolor in the future. But I'm going to, since there's so much yellow on the page and it makes it hard for me to rest my hand, I'm going to go ahead and let those yellows dry before I apply any other colors. So while I wait for the butter yellow to dry, I mixed up a really, hopefully nice, light pink that I can use to do the blush on Kara's cheeks and also the insides of Pancake's nose, or <laughs> his ears, sorry, not even thinking. I think I was debating whether or not I also wanted to do his nose with the pink. And then we start with the blush. And I'm gonna go ahead, clean out the brush a little bit and just sort of blend it a little. Grab a little more to do the tops of her eyes. Underside of her neck. Palms and fingertips. And then I'm also going to do, I don't like any of the yellows on my palettes. Let's see if I can find a cool influence yellow. Sure. Whole wine set has one. And then we'll start doing his eyes. And they're a yellow green, so I usually like to start with just a solid yellow base. Drop a little green, hopefully this will work. While the eyes continue to dry, I'm gonna go ahead and start on the syrup. So I'm gonna activate, looks like a burnt umber, just kind of a nice medium brown, somewhat warm, but not overly so, and decent transparency. And 
And I'm going to start with the syrup container. And I'm going to leave some unpainted that'll help push the illusion that this is glass. So go up there, get this as well. Because you know these syrup containers always end up kind of sticky. Probably have done the pancakes first. I still need to do those, but it's okay. Ideally, I like to get all of the mass shapes, the big shapes, uh, done first and then go in and sort of work smaller. I'm going to try to leave some areas unpainted to indicate a reflection of the light that'll make for a more dynamic painting rather than going in and adding white, but I'll do that as well. A little bit of white, not as much as I should, but some. And I can only imagine how annoying it would be to be a cat and have syrup all over you. That would be pretty crummy. Our first layer of syrup complete. I'm going to go in with that buttery yellow. Work a little more on the dress. And it's light enough that I don't need to blend it, but I'm going to. Just smooth that transition out a little bit. And then I'll go ahead and do another all over coat on the butter. And I think it's a good time to mix up a color that can be used as the base for the pancakes. So I want, I'm going to want golden brown tops, but I'm going to want nice flaky light middles. I'm going to grab the same brown I used as the base for a syrup, and I apologize that this is all off camera. And a little bit of Venetian red. And hopefully that'll serve as a good basis for the pancakes. The pancakes, pancakes. Next, I am going to work on developing Kara's skin a little bit more. Trying to leave room for some contrast. All right, it's a good second layer. I should have probably left more contrast on her face. But that's okay. And then with that yellow, I want to work with it a little more saturated. Oh, that might be a little too much saturated. Grab some of the diluted color. And what I'm going to do, blend that out a little bit. I want some of this color up on there, so I'm gonna there we go. We get a really nice butter yellow. Do the same certain areas of her skirt. Blend some of them out just a little bit. And go over here. And over here. Ah, 
that's a nice color. Pick up some of that excess down there. Maybe even bring it up there. I'm gonna go back into that butter. Get some of that nice, rich color as well. A little concern now about those plates. They are very bright. Um, I did want them to be bright because they're Fiesta Wear and Fiesta Wear comes in like these really nice, intense colors, very cheerful colors, but they are definitely loud. So I'm gonna let these things dry and start thinking about a way that I can kind of mute some of that without losing it totally. I am gonna have to do the base color on pancake and the pancakes on pancake before I can get to that, but it's good to start thinking about it ahead of time. All right, I'm gonna do the first layer on the pancakes. I'm gonna do it as an all over layer. And this is the lightest layer. It is the visually white fluffy part. But I'm gonna do it as an all over layer just to sort of have a nice consistent base for the colors used. There's a pat of butter that I needed to need to go back and add another layer to. that's our first base layer on the pancakes. I think it's a good start. I'm going to grab a little more brown and a little more Venetian red and after this dries I can go back in and do another layer on that. I'm going to grab the nice rich buttery sunshiny yellow. That's really pretty as it is but I'm going to blend it out just a little bit. There we go. Looks like it's catching the light, which is nice. Grab some more of that. Just sort of hit that side there. Maybe the bottom there. And then I'm also going to add a little more blush to her cheeks and the palms of her hands. All right, looking good so far. And then this is actually dry enough that I can go in with that slightly darker color and I'm just going to kind of work it in here and there because if you look at pancakes that sort of lighter edge of the pancake there's still lots of shadow going on in there. Then I have a syrup drip that didn't get painted so go ahead and And I'm still thinking about my two plates. All right, so now we can finally do a fill on pancake here using that. It's basically a gray, but it's multiple grays and it's going to end up becoming a black. But even when you're painting black like black cats, you still want to start light and work your way dark. The way we can build up contrast light and color, plus even black cat fur. In fact, often, especially black cat fur, will catch and reflect the light in really pretty ways. So by working a little bit lighter, it's not like we're painting a matte black surface. We have room to develop that fur in those colors. And since I'm just kind of doing an overall fill here, I've got my squirrel hair brush. So I'm basically dumping water onto the paper, or rather, dumping paint, pigment plus water, onto the paper. In my opinion, squirrel hair brushes do make for pretty decent mops for kind of tighter areas, because you, shoot, you can apply a lot of paint very quickly 
but they're not prohibitively expensive and it's not like you're looking for super fine detail necessarily. I mean, it's always really nice. It's nice to get to paint with nice brushes. It's nice to get to paint with nice, nice things. I'm not denying or arguing against that, but if you can't afford the nice, nice things, an inexpensive squirrel brush can sort of help fill that gap. I'll go it. I got some onto his little pink tongue. Hopefully I can lift this. Yep, pretty good. That's what I get for spacing out while I fill areas with color. All right, we've got a good first layer there. Now to let it dry. Let's go ahead and get that little pink cat tongue painted. And hopefully I won't mess that up again. And a little more pink here on the face. And then we can start mixing our color for the main body of the pancake the food pancake, not pancake, the cat pancake. So I want kind of a golden brown. So I'm grabbing burnt sienna, a little bit of Venetian red, burnt umber, and then also some new gamboge. With watercolor, especially if you're just doing a single illustration, I'm always amazed by how much you can get done in just an afternoon. So I feel like we started today with pretty much nothing painted on the paper except that background blue and the tablecloth. And I feel like, not that today is over, but I feel like we're going to end the day with a nice solid start, lots of progress. I know at least here on YouTube, watercolor isn't necessarily as popular as uh, marker stuff, Copic marker stuff. But once you've made the investment, and you actually need far fewer colors of watercolor than you need of Copics, once you've made the investment, it, I think it's more bang for your buck. Okay, I'm gonna go back in and shade some of this with that golden brown color. Not that there's anything wrong with Copics. I love them also, but if cost is a factor, then watercolor should be your friend. Okay, so like I said, we've got a really nice base going on here. Nice start. Um, I am going to grab a little bit of permanent mauve, which is like kind of an intense light purple, very red light purple. And I found that it's actually a really nice shading color for yellows, like Kara's dress and the butter. Um, it tones it down a little bit without muting the color entirely, which was something that was happening for me if I used blues or cooler purples. So. I'm going to use a little bit because I don't want it to get too muddy or downbeat. You can always also go in and tighten some of these shadows up a little bit more. But you see how that kind of cools it down. Actually, my camera is recording it a little warmer than it is. this in real life. It works pretty well. Better than some of the other mixes I've tried for yellows. Now I might still need to go in with a little bit of purple just for like the most extreme. Do a little bit more there. That might have been regrettable. That's okay. 
do some more over here and then blend that out a little bit. And then once this dries, I think I'm going to go over it again with some more yellow. So it's, I don't know, <laughs> I've kind of really messed with the color a lot. It's kind of messing with my eyes. So I grab a little bit of dioxine violet, which is a much darker purple, a little bit of that permanent mauve, and then a little bit of Payne's gray. Get cast shadow here over on the butter. And then once that dries, I'll go in. In fact, I can start going in with that purple color I mixed that I used on the butter. And yellow is always a challenge for me to shade. Here in the dress where it'll be wet, it's wet. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to go over this again. Just because we lose, we lost a lot of the yellowness of this dress, which is a shame. But I think once we do that other coat of yellow, it'll look a lot better. Okay, let's hopefully fix this dress and give it another layer of buttery yellow. Hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed. Y'all cross your fingers in the audience for me. So basically, the purple works as an under worked as an underglaze in this case, and now we're doing an overglaze where we are applying more of the color we want. It's influencing the color underneath. It's also being influenced by the color underneath, but it's more cohesive as a whole. All right. Then we'll do the same with this butter over here. Butter over here, I'll be over there. And this butter up here. Get some of that darker. I know I still kind of really messed it up. Oh well. That happens. And some dark Payne's gray. Blend that out a little bit. All right, let's see. Before we get too far in, I want to try, try and fix this place. And what I decided was going to work, is going to work, we're gonna make it work, is I'm gonna grab, for the reddish plate, I'm gonna grab some nap naphthamide maroon, which is a Daniel Smith color, and it's a nice, warm, kind of maroony red. And I'm also gonna grab a little bit of neutral tint. Mix those together, gives me kind of a purpley color, might not work. Let's see, grab. Actually, we'll grab some alizarin crimson and throw that in there too. Just throw all the colors in there, really. But maybe if I begin with alizarin crimson, we'll have better results. I think yes. I think we will have better results if we begin with the alizarin crimson. All right, and then maybe a little blenda blenda. All right, not a bad solution. Okay, then I'm going to grab, hmm, it's a very intense blue. So I'm gonna grab from Windsor Newton Indigo. And maybe some of the blue 
from earlier. In fact, that alizarin crimson dries a lot lighter than I thought it would. Alright, so again we're going to step away and let it dry. Alright, so I feel like I kind of messed that dress up. I'm going to try, I know, me trying to fix things, it's always, always ends badly, but I'm going to mix some orange, very light orange, into our yellow. And basically just hope that I can handle this in such a way that it'll make visual sense and it won't look so messy. I mean, we've kind of lost that nice, very light yellow color, and that's unfortunate. It's not the same color as the actual butter anymore. That was kind of, kind of bugging me. And then I'm going to use some of the original yellow shade. Okay, I think that does actually work. Hooray! Grab some more of the yellow and go for kind of an intense coverage. And our plates are still a little damp. So I'm going to do. I'm going to grab a very, very, very light amount of Payne's Gray. Because right now I think this doesn't have any color to it at all. I'm just going to paint over a lot of the syrup. Just to help give the impression that it's in a container. And then grabbing more of the Payne's Gray. I'm going to go in here. Just kind of fill that. Get that as well, but blend that one out. And it's okay that it's kind of blending into the glass. Hopefully that'll even give it a neat kind of look to it. And another layer for contrast on the skin. Time to go ahead and apply another coat of golden brown to our pancakes of the edible, edible variety, not of the cat variety. And I think I'm going to need to mix this darker because it's just not quite as delicious as I would like it to be. It's a nice light fawn color, but not, not quite delicious pancakes. However, while this is still wet, grab some, not as wet as I would like though. Grab some burnt sienna and just kind of work it into some of the areas wet into wet. That way we'll get a little bit of color variation. Which happens when pancakes aren't necessarily evenly cooked. So some areas will be a little, little more golden than others. 
pretty nice so far. Maybe grab just a little bit more. Then, using naphthamide maroon, the one I mentioned earlier, but we didn't actually get to apply, I'm going to go ahead and fill in, or do a layer of fill on this cat's mouth. And then grabbing a layer of hunter green, or grabbing some hunter green. Go ahead and do a layer on his eyes as well. Now for Miss Kara, we're just about ready to start mixing the sh uh, shadow tone for her skin. So using just a bit of that naphthamide maroon mixed in with some permanent mauve. I'm going to mix a red violet. It's a little too dark for the tongue. It will work for the inside of the mouth. So what I'm going to do is get the inside of the mouth and then... And actually, since I dabbled, I mean it has to dry fully, but I actually think the pancakes are looking really cute now. So I may not go in and do that further layer that we discussed. Thinking about it, this tablecloth needs a few spots of syrup because if you've got a tiny person and a cat enjoying pancakes, they will probably get syrup on the table. So what I'm going to do first is I'm actually going to paint the shadows from the syrup droplets and I think doing that will allow me to paint the syrup on top of it effectively. And then looking at that, I'm going to grab naphthamide maroon and a couple different reds and just get, I think the areas that would be the most in shadow. And then do the same on the butter plate using some indigo and some neutral tint. And let's see now. I can go one of two ways from this point because we started doing um, the shadow color on Kara's skin. We can probably do her hair next or we can do another color another layer on pancake and I the cat not the pancakes and I'm thinking doing another layer on the cat is a good idea so I grabbed some Holbein antique black and I put it on my craft mat and I'm just going to mix that in with the base color we've already got going for little pancake And let's see how, ooh, if that's the actual color, it looks like it might be. So if you usually work from pans the way I do, and you're usually working from dried colors, you may find that if you're having trouble getting your colors saturated enough, because that's something people often comment about my work is how um, saturated I can get some of my colors. Uh, I would suggest that you also try working from tubes every now and then. Like, not necessarily straight from the tube, but without letting it dry first or any of that. Because sometimes you can get much, much, much more concentrated color. So I'm a little concerned with this black that I will lose my definition of form since this is a much more 
intense. And we made kind of a, a significant tonal shift base or color shift basically. Um, I guess this would be tone. So I am a little concerned that I might start losing some of these forms. So what I'm going to try to do is take it slow, leave highlights as you can see here, and blend. Hopefully that will help me maintain some of the definition in the forms. Another solution would be to paint individual parts separately and then let those dry. This is when it would be nice to be a monster girl with four arms because I could blend and paint at the same time instead of stopping and blending like I'm doing here and then moving on to work another area. However, I am just a human girl and I only have two arms, so. I bet most of my audience is human and you've only got two arms at best. At most, you only have two arms, so. We'll all struggle in our affliction of not having four arms to paint with together. Although I think it is drying much, much lighter. So even though I did like how nice and dark this black is going down, I'm a little relieved to see that it isn't quite so dark. And I actually find painting little black cats like Pancake to be one of the hardest things because if I err on the side of caution and leave him light enough that you can like easily define, see all his, all his, his limbs and such, then he comes out gray. And he's not gray, he's a little black cat. But if I go too heavy handed on cheaper papers, you often can't really make out his figure too well. I think though on this nice cotton rag paper, it will not be such a problem. Yes, he sure is cute. He is a cute boy. My first cat was a black cat, so I'm very, I don't currently have any, I have a gray cat, but I am very, very partial to black cats. I wasn't quite ready for another black cat, just because I'm still not over midnight, and that's been like 17 years. But I think black cats are the best cats, and I think they are lucky. At least maybe this little pancake is lucky. Okay, going to grab some more Payne's Gray. Probably at the point where I can remove all the clips. They are probably not helping. Choked up a little bit too much on this Series 7 brush. Sometimes, in fact, most of the time when I paint, I hold my breath a little bit. Um, and some of that is definitely, it does help to a degree with my control. But, but a lot of it is also just the suspense of painting. I'm a little bit of a ridiculous person. I'm okay with that though. All right, so I'm grabbing a little bit of purple. All right, I think it's actually coming along pretty nice. We 
I think we might be out of the ugly stage and into like the actual <laughs> starting to look kind of good, kind of making some progress stage, you know, the best stage. We're past the ugly, the rough stage, the, the, the scary stage, the tight walk stage, the is this really going to work or is my life a total sham stage. There we go. Looking pretty good, looking pretty good. And cake is still pretty damp, but we're making good progress on him. I think we can start working again on all that delicious syrup. So the first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna grab some of the original brown, which is probably burnt umber. And I'm going to paint in those syrup droplets we talked about. The ones I said would surely be on the tablecloth if you have an 11 year old girl and a cat eating pancakes. Pretty sure that would be all over the place. In fact, surprise, Kara hasn't just completely thrown herself into the moment and decided to join him being covered in syrup and eating all of the delicious sugar. But instead, she's a little concerned that they're going to eat him. Oh no, she's not familiar with the concept of pancakes. She does not know that pancakes is also a food and not just a cat. I'm grabbing a little bit more of the burnt umber. I'm gonna start delineating some of the drops here on this probably very sticky syrup dispenser. And then I'll delineate these drops a little better. Probably one of the nicest parts of watercolor for me is when things are starting to come together. I can start to actually see how things are going to look and what needs to be fixed and what needs to be developed and what's working out okay. My favorite part. Oh, actually, for the syrup on him, I want to do, sorry, painting more syrup on the plate because, you know, somehow this plate is remarkably syrup clean and that's just not, it just doesn't do, it's just not going to work. I need loads of syrup. As a kid, I basically... So first of all, I don't like maple syrup. I know I'm weird. I also don't like sugar cane syrup. I know, I'm weird. Um, I like the fake stuff. And I, I do like honey. Um, but I like the fake stuff. So like Mrs. Buttersworth, I would basically drink that stuff as a kid. Like all over my waffles. And they had to be the cheap waffles because that's what I liked. Okay, we're going to paint a little bit of black underneath. And this is going to help give the appearance of translucency to the syrup, which is something I want it to have. And then I'm blending it out a little bit. At least I hope it will look like it's translucent. This is what I do for other translucent in, uh, materials. The problem is that because he is a black kitten and the syrup is dark, is going to be dark brown, it may not work as well. We'll find out. Okay, there we go. A little bit of underpainting there. Let that dry. And you guys probably have noticed that I often use the blue painter's tape that I use to secure my paper. I'll often use it as kind of like a side palette or a mixing area, especially for just small batches of color. That's definitely a mixed bag kind of situation. It's convenient, but I drag my hand through that all the time. So that's buyer beware. And I'm sure like a serious traditionally trained watercolorist would have a fit with that. Maybe not. Maybe they're as bad as I am. It's just one of those things that it's convenient and when you have limited space,
you're really trying to make the most of what you do have. Okay, gonna leave some white highlights. Well, not really white, so much as lighter color highlights for the syrup up there. Drip, 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 drip. Should probably be my birthday present to myself to figure out a better recording uh, option for watercolor. This is pretty backbreaking. Okay, blend some of that out just a little bit. Otherwise, that's looking it's looking pretty good. Maybe even do like a darker core on the syrup bottle. And I think I can get started with Kara's hair. And for her hair, I've been using this uh, Winsor Newton Series 7. It's like a larger one. It's a 5. It was a, it was a gift because <laughs> the larger sizes are really pretty prohibitive. But it has a lot of really beautiful snap which can be really, really nice for doing things like hair and leaving reflections. It's just easier if you have a good brush and you're not basically just pushing the paint around. You can also do finer, tighter details with a nicer brush, even a larger size nicer brush. I just really a joy. They're a lot more fun to paint with than crummy, chewed up, cat, gnawed on brushes. It's probably like driving a sports car after you've had a Kia Optima. Which, so I I'm a late bloomer. I didn't learn how to drive until I was 24. Joseph taught me how to drive on his horse, which was incredibly kind of him because neither of my parents would teach me how to drive on their cars. And uh, I was getting ready to move to Savannah, Georgia, so I really, really needed to learn how to drive or I was going to be very, very stuck. Um, but I ended up buying my mom's 10 year old Kia Optima from her. It was basically third hand because. She bought it secondhand from a place that sold uh, Enterprise cars that were no longer fit for the fleet. And she'd had it for, I don't know, like five or six years. And then she got a new car and I bought her Kia from her and really <laughs> put a lot of, I put a lot of miles. I put a lot of abuse on that car because that car did a lot of trips with me to Louisiana. But like literally every time I would take that car on a long trip something catastrophic would happen and it would leave me like literally every time and it would leave me stranded somewhere that I just didn't really know anybody and I didn't really have anywhere to stay so uh when that thing finally died the transmission started to go and it was like one of those things where it was like well we can replace it but it's going to cost seven hundred dollars and it'll probably it's, it's just like the start of a bunch of new terrible problems I was like it is time to own a car that I can rely on. And I, ironically, I bought a Volkswagen Jetta TDI, the diesel model, you know, the one that kicked off the whole, whole trend of lying on your emissions tests. That's my car now. It's actually not a bad car. It's not a sports car. But when I was um, picking out, when I was test driving cars, I test drove a Miata because I'd always wanted a little two-seater convertible and I opted to get a car that is basically a family a small family car because uh, I plan on even if even if 
Volkswagen lied. I plan on keeping my car for the next 10 years because I don't have the money to buy a new car. Um, or a different car, even. I like that car, too. I mean, it's got its own problems, but, like, it's my car. Uh, but I did drive. I did test drive, like, a couple of different uh, convertibles. The, I think it's, like, the EOS. Volkswagen had, like, a little, I really didn't like their, their four-seater convertible. That thing was ugly. Um, I test drove that, and I test drove a Miata. I test drove, like, two or three Miatas, actually, because I was really really considering it but since i do conventions and convertible is just like a luxury you can't have if you're hauling loads of convention stuff hither and yon so ended up with ended up buying a jetta and that's kind of what i wanted anyway but I, it was good that I test drove a bunch of different cars because I'd pretty much only driven two cars before then. Joseph's Taurus, which was already, it's still around actually, uh, but it was old at the time. I learned how to drive with on it. It had had its life. Uh, and then a Kia that was also old and it had its life. So it's a, it's a good thing that I'd like had a chance to drive some new fun cars with lots of horsepower before I settled into my mom car life. Hopefully I didn't cover too much territory on her face. By that I mean I hope I left enough contrast but I'm slightly afraid that I did not. Oh well. Okay, let that dry and then we can do another layer on pancake or yeah, probably another layer on pancake. And actually add the blush back to her cheeks because it became a lot less noticeable. Okay, so I'm going to grab just a little bit of purple mixed with a little bit of Payne's Gray. So kind of making a neutral tint. Just right here, cast shadow where her head would be casting a shadow on her neck and then right there on her arm and then Where her hair, and maybe also if I can get there without having to rest my hand on anything. Good, excellent. Oh, had too much water in it, so it just kind of blorped out. Let's see if we can't fix that. A little bit of that sort of neutral tintish color to do some shadow on the pancakes. Hopefully that'll dry a little lighter than I put it down, but it's not too bad a pick. And once that dries, we can opt to either do another layer on pancake or do another layer on the syrup. Now that this is dry, we're gonna work on that syrup some more with some Van Dyke Brown. And I'm just really gonna use the Van Dyke Brown to kind of denote some of the darkest areas of the syrup. Don't want it to be too overwhelming. You guys can also probably tell that by this point I'm actually having a lot of fun. And 
um, people are usually really surprised. I bring the original pages from 7-inch Kara with me when I do shows, and I have them out on a por in a portfolio to show people because they don't believe me that I'm doing a long-form webcomic in watercolor. Like, that's crazy talk. And um, is. Uh, and it's usually like, well, that's, that's so time-consuming. You must be very patient. I am horribly not patient. I... I will do six things at one time. I will paint three pages or four or five or sometimes even six pages at a time. It really kind of depends on the scene. Um, and I'll also be working on a blog post or even a video while I'm painting. I am a very, very impatient person. Um, but that's okay because I've found working methods that kind of allow me to be myself and still get to use watercolor. And watercolor really, I mean, it is time consuming, but it isn't as bad as everybody thinks it is. It isn't as, as slow, or maybe I just enjoy those elements of it, but it works. I think it works for me and I have a lot of fun doing it. And there are definitely points in watercolor where I'm really excited uh, I'm just feeling what I'm doing it's it's almost like working magic and that's kind of an addictive feeling so yeah it is a time-consuming thing uh, I don't necessarily think it's more time-consuming than markers uh, maybe a little bit more but I do I work with both um, they both have their strong points. With watercolor, if I need to go run errands or something, if something happened, um, there are loads of points where I can just put down what I'm doing and walk away and come back to it and it'll be, it'll be okay. Whereas with marker, um, once I start painting, once I start rendering with markers, it is really hard for me to be able to put it down and then be able to come back to it. because it's not as blendy. I'm just trying to do, imply the serrations on a butter knife. Now, for recording, I would say markers is probably easier and more fun. Just because watercolor, I also have to stretch it and that's like a really, big uh, space constraint and it kind of limits what I can do on camera. But in terms of enjoyability, I think watercolor is at least as fun as markers and I definitely think it's actually more uh, forgiving. Do another layer of Kara's hair. Working with more saturated Venetian brown, which is kind of an opaque color. So you kind of want to be deliberate at what point you start introducing it. Because it can really, it'll reactivate and it'll make the colors around it muddy when it reactivates and mixes in. So you don't want to glaze on top of this color. Or if you do, you want to keep it limited to the area of this color. So. Trying to not only preserve, but build up those highlights. I'd also like to get to the point where I can do more marker things because I've been doing so many watercolor things for my water, both for Kara as a comic and for my watercolor basics series over on the blog, which requires not only just a tremendous amount of time to write everything up, but it's really um, just <laughs> requires a lot of video too to demonstrate certain things. 
So I've been doing all these like bonus watercolor videos to demonstrate very specific techniques in kind of like a, a bite-sized way. And it's frustrating because like ever since I've started writing and recording more about watercolor, like my hit, my hits for everything have gone down. And I know that if I switched over to marker, it would rebound because like every time I do marker stuff, people like that a lot better. Got my hand in the wet. But I'm gonna persevere. I'm gonna finish out the watercolor basic series this year. I feel like I'm pretty close to finishing it, so I'll finish that. And uh, keep working on Kara. And then in 2019, I'm taking the blog offline. And I'm gonna mm, make PDFs available to my patrons of some of the best content from there. And just like have phase two of my life. Maybe I'll do more guest posts for other art blogs. I don't know. Maybe I'll, uh, me and a couple of friends have been talking off and on about doing a podcast. So maybe, maybe I'll do that. I don't know. Uh, I'm a little, uh, I have a little trepidation about it because I've done the blog for 10 years as of 2019. So that's a really long time. Um, but you know, 10 years is also like a huge life commitment. 10 years is, like I said, a massive commitment of time um, and dedication, especially since I, I don't think I've ever updated less than twice a week. So you guys can do the math on that. But it also never opened up the doors I wanted it to. So, you know. Time to move on. Time to do something new with my my skill set and my abilities. And I think it's going to give me more time to focus on actually making comics, which is kind of what I've wanted to do. What I mean, I've been doing it from the start, but it's what I've wanted to do since I was like 13 and have done since I was like 13. <laughs> so, you know, being able to focus on that and not on like endless things that nobody cares about, not really, um, will be good, It'll be nice. A little more pink on her cheeks, but it's coming along really well, and I'm going to let her dry, and then I'm going to come back and work on pancake, and I may come back and also darken some of the areas of the pancakes themselves but they look really cute so i'm kind of hesitant to do that because they're turning out okay so anyway let things dry and i'll be back okay so everything's had a bit of a chance to dry we're gonna go back in now with that nice black maybe even pick up a little bit more of the holbein antique black And I'm going to dual wield brushes in order to get some nice color blends. And what's so nice about these nicer watercolor papers is that, and this is Kilimanjaro, so this is um, the Cheap Joe's watercolor cotton rag paper. So it's not, I'm not painting on arches, I'm not painting on something really expensive, but it's nice. It is very blendable. It stays open a long time. And it handles a lot like arches. So what's really nice about using cotton rag papers is they do oops, stay open and blendable longer 
then their cellulose counterparts. They can take a lot of layering, a lot of blending, without the colors getting muddy. It's just, you know, you can really do a lot on these kind of papers. They're really a joy to work with. Of course, they're more expensive, um, and you may have a harder time finding them in that if, like, Michaels or Walmart are where your primary sources of art supplies, you're, you're probably going to have a hard time finding cotton rag papers, but you can definitely find them online. And you can always order some of them. You can't order uh, Kilimanjaro and you can't order Blick Premier off of Amazon because they're both store brands for art supply stores. But you can get Arches, you can get uh, Canson Moulin de Roy, you can get Canson uh, Heritage La Crelle or La Crelle Heritage. You can get nicer uh, watercolor papers online. And you can also go onto the Dick Blick site and get their premier paper. Or you can go onto the uh, Cheap Joe's site and get their paper. So you don't have to be at a physical location. And I know for many of us, we have to touch it before we can trust it. So I know me, me saying this doesn't really help a whole lot because it doesn't, you can't touch the paper. I'm waiting for Jerry's to come out with a nice uh, cat and rag watercolor paper and then the trifecta will be complete. And then I can also go to Jerry's whenever I need to get my fix. I don't have a problem with arches. Um, I actually really do enjoy painting on it, in fact, but it is kind of cost prohibitive and more and more store brands are starting to offer really nice, uh, nice competition. So I'm more than happy to give them my money and see if it's a good fit for my needs. And I've been really pleased with the Blick Premier and with Kilimanjaro and both done an excellent job. Okay. So I'm going to grab a little bit of very light Payne's Gray. Now I just can't leave this poor yellow dress alone. Okay, so it looks like we have made some really, really good progress today. I'm going to go back in with that golden brown I mixed up to kind of darken up the pancakes. And I'll grab a little bit of burnt sienna. Because having those golden areas is just really lovely and it makes them look like they've been cooked in a griddle and they're nice and warm and ready to eat. It probably feels, other than the sticky, it probably feels pretty good to be at the bottom of that pancake pile. Especially if you can look up and eat some pancakes. just do so many lovely things on decent watercolor paper. Such nice blends. And instead of getting muddy, the colors hold on to the paper. Yeah, I think this might be a good, good stopping point for this evening, or at least close to one. neutral tint over on this one. I think I will step away for this evening so that tomorrow I can return with fresh eyes 
and I can hopefully finish this piece. So I did exactly for once, as I said I was gonna do, and I actually walked away for the evening last night. So it is the next morning. I'm grabbing a little bit of Payne's Gray. Just uh, dop on that uh, butter pat right there, blend it out a little bit. Grab some thicker grain, grains pain, <laughs> pain's gray. Yeah, this painting, this paper, the Kilimanjaro paper is actually really nice to paint on. Takes the paint really well. Let me grab some of the black I'd mixed. It's had plenty of time to evaporate. And I'm just gonna hit some of the darkest areas of shadow. Go in to this area over here. Otherwise though, it's coming along really nice. I'm really pleased with it. That might be a little saturated, so. Just go back over it, redisperse some of that. Skin had a chance to evaporate last night too a little bit, so it's much darker now. Basically, I'm just getting it cleaned and tightened up so that I can do some of the final details in the last layers. All right, I'm gonna let that dry, go clean out my water and be back. So one of the first details I wanna go ahead and do is I wanna do some flowers on Kara's dress. I'm gonna grab some of that urban blue violet. I kind of feel strength. And since Kara's little, I'll paint them kind of big. So we're gonna start with some nice big blue roses because that's totally a real thing. And I'm kind of just doing loose floral shapes based on what I've kind of observed from mini prints, mini fabric prints, I should say. And I want the print to be kind of full without it being like just an overwhelming mess. So I'm gonna try to develop it without it getting too bad. Then we're going to do some pink rosebuds, or maybe even we should do like little, little pink flowers. And it's fun to be able to do surface design kind of stuff every now and then. Uh, I do try to have it in the comics sometimes, like if she's wearing an outfit uh, in one or two panels or on just one page. But if I have to paint like 20 pages of her wearing like a surface pattern that you know you need to be somewhat accurate with I try to avoid it just because uh, since this is a watercolor comic I'm doing by hand well, of course I'm doing it by hand but uh, since I'm doing it traditionally and it already has a lot of time constraints that's uh, something I try to be economical with I mean, I want it just enough that you can tell that I enjoy doing details and fabric decoration and not so much that I feel like I'm going to go crazy. And then some loose green leaf. Oh, thank you, brush. You have decided a leaf needs to go there. All right. And the blue gets kind of lost on this yellow. It can be intensified a bit with um, like color pencil or gouache. I'm gonna probably use color pencil over it. 
Next, I'm going to go ahead and paint in her freckles and I'm using Venetian red. It's kind of a big one, hopefully it'll dry a little lighter than that. And I'm going to go ahead and activate Van Dyke Brown and Sepia. I'm going to need those in a minute. And I'll give this a chance to dry. Next up, we're going to go ahead and fill in Pancake's eyes. And then hopefully my Van Dyke Brown has had enough time to activate that I can get started on Kara's hair. And I'm using that wonderful Seri 7 brush with lots of flexibility and snap. And nice large capacity for paint because I know it's going to get the job done really well. That had a time, uh, blah, 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 blah. that had a chance to dry. Now we're on to the second layer of Van Dyke Brown which is a nice dark reddish brown. And then on her dress, I'm gonna hopefully tighten up some of these lines here by outlining them with a mixture of yellow ochre and that sunny yellow we've been working with and hopefully that'll just sort of make them less graphite-y. And I'm gonna grab, I'll pull out, sorry about that, grab some naphthamide maroon. So something disappointing I am noticing about this particular Kilimanjaro, and I don't know if I did something nasty to the paper while I was penciling it or what, but it has been very prone bleeding out just a little bit which is probably not even noticeable if you work large or if you um, do looser illustrations but if you do tighter work like this it, it does become noticeable and it's something you then have to correct for going to go ahead, tighten up some of the details in her hair with sepia. And depending on which sepia you buy, because the color can differ from brand to brand, um, you can get something that's like almost, almost a brown black to something that's a very desaturated brown. And and um, sometimes even kind of a gray color. The CPI I'm using here is Windsor & Newton's Half Pan. So it's more of a very dark brown. It's a little darker than um, Van Dyke Brown, which is the color I'd used before. And it is usually the color I use for the last layer on Kara's hair like I'm doing right now. And I'm gonna 
dip back into the skin tone. And use it to very delicately ink over some of the pencil lines like we did with the yellow on the dress. Just to kind of clean things up, tighten things up, make them look a little more consistent. Unfortunately, I am working with a long handled watercolor brush and it wants to hit everything. I actually really don't like long handled watercolor brushes and I usually, if they have a short handle available, I'll get that. But I picked this up at Underground in Toronto and I'm pretty sure I checked. And they did not have a good short handle, so that's okay. I'll pick up some more of that urban blue violet. I'll switch over to a smaller brush. And hopefully, I can do this without screwing up. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. I'm going to try to get in there and ink Kara's eyelashes. In fact, I may even stop the video so that I can position this better. Somehow though I managed to get that so I'll take that and I'll use a little bit of the Payne's Gray here on the belt. I had really hoped, I know I talked about 7-inch Kara and my comics a little bit. I really hoped I would be able to do a little bit more of that in this video. Unfortunately, sometimes it's hard for me to do a thing and talk about something completely different. One of those can't walk and chew gum at the same time kind of people. But it has been a project I've worked on for a long time. It started in 2012 as part of my thesis project for SCAD and I've been working on it ever since. Uh, I wish I could say more on than off but you know when you're doing conventions and you're running a channel and you're also running a blog unfortunately sometimes your priorities get kind of screwy and you don't get to put as much time into it as you would like. So unfortunately Last year I just didn't work on it as much as I really should have and that made me really sad and really unhappy with myself and my choices so I made it a resolution to work on it like a hundred percent more this year and I'm gonna do it. I'm already sticking to that resolution. I've been tracking the days I work on not just like illustrations like this. This doesn't count in terms of that because I've done plenty of Kara illustrations here on this channel. But uh, like actual stuff directly related to the comic. So I've been working on chapter eight, chapter four, up to chapter four has been released. Um, all of chapter four has been released. I have a bonus comic coming up that I also recorded a video of me kind of working on it, walking you guys through what I was doing. Um, I have a bonus comic coming up and then chapter five starts. And chapter five is the first chapter from the second volume. And the second volume is a doozy. A lot of the story happens in the second volume. Um, a lot of the character development happens now that I have established the plot but it is also a really long volume. There's going to be four full chapters in it and then a bonus chapter. And I have three of the four done. I'm working on chapter eight, the last full chapter. And it's just, <laughs> every chapter in that volume is just a long chapter. They're all 20 plus pages. They're as long as they need to be, but you know, it means volume two is going to be twice as thick, almost literally twice as thick as volume one. And that's just, that's okay. That's just how it's going to be. 
but I'm working hard to get volume two finished so that I can kickstart it. Like I think I mentioned earlier, and I'm aiming for August and having a concrete goal like that over my head has also been good for forcing me to prioritize. But this week I finished doing the script. I had people beta read it for me and I'm very appreciative of their time. Cause that really helps me out a lot. Helps me make the best product I possibly can. Um, people beta read it for me. Let's see. So the script is printed. Oh, I went through and I figured out all the outfit changes uh, because there's several scenes that denote passing of time. So it's really important to show different characters in different outfits. So hang on a sec. I did a final tally and I have 45 I think it's 45, it might be 46, 45 outfit changes for chapter eight. So what I'm doing right now is I'm sketching out all of the outfits, like going through the script and sketching out all the outfits um, so that I have that as a reference when I am ready to start doing thumbnails and ready to start doing roughs. And I'm hoping that by spending the time and researching it and thinking about it now, instead of as I'm doing it, I'll have a stronger end product. Okay, we are really close to finish. I'm gonna grab some Haynes Gray. And just darken up that side of the butter a little and some of these pancakes as well and the bonus comic also doesn't count as working on it um, because that's for the web only uh, and the whole point of this is to get volume two out sorry I'm just kind of looking over things I think next we can switch over do, 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 do to a white this is not a watercolor pencil and ink tense people always want to correct me on that so I, I relish your corrections and I have changed my behavior to see and they're right it's it's technically well they're right wrong um it is ink I believe it's like an India ink kind of thing for these so they're right on that uh but one of the rationales is that it isn't watercolor because once you've set it once you've painted water over it it is immovable which is true but that isn't a trait just of ink there's a lot of watercolors that um once you've added water they're pretty firmly on the page so they're they're right but they're also a little bit being pedantic with their rationale for why that's okay. I am super, I am a very pedantic person when it comes to art supplies, especially over on the blog. So I right. welcome that challenge me. Let's hold each other to higher standards of accountability. But let's also like, I'm not talking about myself, but like, let's also be kind to people who are still learning or they're new. We don't need to be pedantic with them. Or people who are just like, I don't care. I don't want, <laughs> I'm not that invested in this. Like, let's also respect their boundaries. Basically, let's not turn this into like proof that you are a good enough or worthy enough artist. I don't think any of you guys watching this would do that, but I'm just adding a little bit of reflection onto the syrup. See what I mean about talking and also doing, it ends up just being a conversation, a one-sided conversation, because I'm doing all the talking. Okay. Let us awesomely drop the microphone. I apologize. 
I'm sure that was noisy, and add some reflection back into the knife. And one of the nice things about ink tents is that you actually get a lot of color. It's one of the reasons I like them so much. I know some people also have kind of mixed feelings about ink tents um, because they don't move a whole lot after they've been wet, but you really get a lot of good color impact, both wet and dry more so than any other uh, brand I've used, so, yeah. Take that for what, oh, Super Color um, by, I believe it's Karen Dosh, is also really good. It's my second favorite. It has good color, saturation, nice properties. And I totally use these when I'm working on Kara, um, a lot of me tightening stuff up is a uh, color pencil. I don't know how obvious it is. Like to me, it's very obvious that I've done corrections with color pencil, which again, makes what I do not, not like, not like legit watercolor, but it, it's illustration and I do comics. So I kind of don't care. I mean, I, <laughs> I guess I care enough to be like, oh, it's not real, not real illustration, not real watercolor, aww. But uh, I don't care enough to change what I do, let's see, or how I refer to it. But I don't use nice papers like this on the comic. I use uh, Canton Montval, which isn't terrible, but it's not, it's not good paper. It's a uh, cellulose base watercolor paper so it does not blend nearly as well as this does um and i did it for a lot of reasons part of it is the cost and the accessibility uh, montval is much cheaper than most nicer watercolor papers it handles better than a lot of cellulose papers so it's kind of like a nice a nice middle ground but I'm getting kind of tired of it. I may do a couple test pages on 300 pound Kilimanjaro or uh, fluid, uh, da, 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 fluid 100, their cotton rag paper and just see, I'm not looking to change the entire look of the comic, um, but I do want to change some of the working properties. I'm not really thrilled with some of the working properties of mm -hmm. looking good so far. Gonna switch over to I am using I could use uh Windsor Newton ah, I should just use Windsor Newton wash. It works better for this. Alright, I'm going to, and let's go ahead and switch over now. So, I've got some white gouache. So, with the white gouache, I'm going to actually remove some of these clips. And I'll zoom out for you guys. And I'm going to put my gouache over here. I'm right handed so there's a good chance I will not get my hand into it, which is a problem. I do that fairly frequently. So as always, if you're not sure what gouache is, gouache is an opaque watercolor. I don't use it too, too often. Um, it's, it's kind of in like the realm of acrylic for me where it's just something that doesn't really click for me. Um, however, for doing watercolor highlights, I really like it, so. And I'm gonna use a really stiff bristle synthetic. This is actually like a model kit synthetic. It's a tester. And that's gonna be strong enough to kind of stand up to the gouache. I find that when I use um, soft bristle brushes with gouache, 
at least for doing corrections, I can't pull the sort of lines I want to pull. And I'm kind of holding my arm in a funny way, uh, just so that I don't kind of cross over anything. found a spot that didn't really get enough color so it's sort of like a open line so I'm just gonna kind of fix that so it's less obvious fix that as well it looks almost done but it just doesn't quite feel done and I'm not sure why not sure what's going on with it that makes it not finished you know what I bet it is something as dumb as just she clearly needs that emanata, which is the visual, non-verbal, non-facial representation of an emotion. In this case, it would be distress. So I'm gonna start some orange. It's already starting to look like it's actually supposed to look. And I'll let that dry. All right, that's somewhat dry onto a lighter orange and I'm not even going to blend that out I'm going to in fact leave some of that scribble mark visible because I like how it looks and then I'm going to grab a red yeah I think I think that's what we were missing Okay, so it looks like it might be done. I want to thank you guys so much for hanging out with me and during my chit chat and everything else. I hope you guys will go check out my comic, 7 Inch Kara. You can check that out at 7inchkara.com or 7inchkara.tumblr.com. It is the one year anniversary this Saturday on February 10th. I am excited about it. I am planning on doing a live stream here on my YouTube channel and I will have more information available if it isn't already available. Um, so I, if you guys like seeing my work, I hope I will see you guys there. And then as soon as I start the sign out, I'm like, oh, I see something that could be improved. But uh, I, I hope I'll see you guys there. I'm going to have some cute things to work on, some fun things to work on, and you guys can help me kind of commemorate a year of webcomiciness together. It is, def it has definitely been a journey, and I plan on writing about. I have a post in progress, in fact, over at natosoup.blogspot.com, um, where I kind of talk about how this has been an unusual experience for me because I did print comics before I did web comics, which um, isn't, it didn't used to be super unusual, but now it's kind of unusual for people to go that way. Um, so I hope you guys will head over there and check that out also, especially if you're interested in doing a comic yourself, interested in doing a web comic, you've been watching what I do because you like web comics or you want to do web comics. Um, it's, I'm trying not to, I'm trying to be a non salty person in that post because there have been ups and downs and a lot of downs to uh, releasing my comic as a web comic. And uh, it, it's just been a learning experience, guys. That's all I'm gonna say, but I am trying to be honest, but not salty in that post, so. Thank you guys again, 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 again for hanging out with me and hopefully I'll see you Saturday. Bye guys.